Thank you, Franco. Uh, my special thanks uh, to Susan Wood, Nestor Maceo, and the scientific committee of the conference for giving me this opportunity to be with you here today and share some of my experience with cyanobacteria. For me, it's a great, great pleasure to be here today with you. I still remember the first time I met Dr. Tundisi in Uruguay. He visited our faculty in the late, the late 80s. We were a bunch of undergraduate students with a very vague idea of what limnology was. He gave a lecture about the importance of studying freshwater ecosystems, something that was completely overlooked in Uruguay at that time. And he finished his talk quoting this poem, which means something like, you have to keep going, you have to do it, you have to go and push. And that is what we did. After so many decades, I am very proud of being part of the Uruguayan limnological community. I am a lucky person because I have the opportunity to share my years of research with so many inspiring people, great colleagues that are my friends, great students that became my colleagues, and they are becoming better and better scientists than me. <laughs> And also, I would like to have an extra moment to pay tribute to Professor Pintos, who was the first professor, uh, the first director of the Limnology Division in Uruguay in the late 80s. He always was trying to um, make us to do our best and keep going. And many years later, I did my postdoc in Canada at the lab of, of Warwick Vincent. Uh, Warwick was and is a mentor to me. A, very kind person, a wise professor, always with a good suggestion and a positive comment about your work. I am coming from Uruguay. It's a quite tiny country uh, with a few people there. We are well known for our soccer players and the national drink, the mate. We have a subtropical climate and a very extensive hydrographic network dominated by glottic ecosystems. As you can see in the left map, the physical map of the country. And we have huge problems with eutrophication. As you can see in the map to the uh, right, how can I, oh. this one. <laughs> Uh, in this map, we are, pl we are plotting uh, average data of total phosphorus in the water in, the major, in, in many of the lotic ecosystems and some lentic ecosystems of the country. And as you can see, for, for a period of five years, as you, as you can see, the values are extremely high. If you are wondering that we have problems with cyanobacteria, considering these values, you are right. We have huge problems with blooms, cyanobacteria blooms. They are everywhere. So before talking about the bad things of cyanobacteria, I would like to, th to say some few words, positive words about cyanobacteria. They are really fascinating organisms. They are fascinating bacteria. They play a key role in global primary production, for sure. But they, at the same time, they, they uh, have some traits that makes them so uh, unique and special. They can be extremely small and gigantic. Giant, sorry, giant. Uh, they, can, they can have different levels of biological organization and they can be so complex that they can anticipate changes in the environment with specialized cells. Also, cyanobacteria are remarkable by the diversity of pigments they have. This is the group that has the highest pigment diversity among all the photolithotrophs. This is, a, this is an essential trait for cyanobacteria and for explaining their success and their they responses to environment. And though this, it's one aspect that has been not very, very much explored in studies about cyanobacteria, or not enough. But of course, cyanobacteria can be very bad. Let's see if this works. Yes. So this is a beach in uh, Montevideo, in Rio de la Plata. It's at the estuary. And here you can tell me if that day you would like to be there <laughs> at the beach. That's a, that's a bloom. Mm -hmm. 
So cyanobacterial blooms, of course, they are a very um, a major problem. They involve public health. And of course, they need to be, uh, in, there are many aspects to consider about cyanobacterial blooms, research, monitoring, and management all together. In my presentation today, I have uh, three sections in the presentation. In the first section, I will talk about the distribution and factors of cyanobacteria with a strong emphasis in the Americas and South America. In the second part, I will talk a little bit about pigment diversities and make a link and with what are the implications of these pigments uh, with monitoring. And the third part will be more devoted to monitoring and the challenges for, for the region, actually. So I will go quite, um, I will show some examples. I won't go in detail in, in many of the information I am showing, but uh, below all the, the slides, I will have the references. And of course, I am very happy to share with you if, if you want it later or if you want to discuss more details. And all the, the references are belonging to our publications. Uh, some I did with the people you saw in the first picture and some with the people you will see in the last picture in collaboration. So if we start with the first part of the study or, or, or of the presentation, which is an overview of the distribution of cyanobacteria. Here we have a, a reservoir in Peru and look at the altitude, it's at 4,500 uh, meters altitude. So I will present um, just the first results of a collaborative initiative that I've been working for a few years with a group of colleagues from different countries in South America. This has been a very productive and very nice initiative. We collect data from lakes from different parts of South America. That is quite, um, is quite a challenge because there are no many open databases for South America concerning cyanobacteria and immunological variables. So we worked together for a few years and we make a database, you know, we clean the data, we check the methodology, et cetera, to, to make it uh, usable. And we have many questions still, and the, the database is still growing, and we are still working with this information. If you look at uh, the North, uh, North America, we, we, of course, we include the information from the National Lake Assessment from the uh, United States, that they have an uh, open data database that you can use. And also we, we got uh, information from the Arctic, the high Arctic in Canada, the subarctic region, and some data from Quebec. And we hope to include soon some data from the Lake Pulse project uh, from Canada too. So in the first, uh, just the first uh, slide here, uh, it's just to show the distribution of biomass of cyanobacteria along the latitudes in the Americas. And we can see that we have a wide variation in this biomass along latitudes without a clear trend related with latitude, except for the extreme, ex sorry, extreme uh, latitudes maybe in the, in the, in the very north, in, in the polar regions. And when we organize the information according to the climate, uh, I, I uh, invite you to, to look at this figure first. Um, we can see where we got higher values of biovolume, and we have three climates where the biovolume were higher, where were temperate climates that include subtropical regions, like uh, in the case in Uruguay, boreal uh, regions, and arid regions. And then we have a low biomass of cyanobacteria in polar regions, which is something that we expected because usually they are extremely oligotrophic, and also low values from tropical lakes uh, that in this case are also not very eutrophic. However, when we see the, oh, sorry. However, when we see this one, uh, the one, the plot below, that is the contribution of cyanobacteria to the total biovolume. And here we, we, we see something a little bit different. And we see that, the, uh, of course, the, the areas where there is more cyanobacteria biovolume, we have more contribution of cyanobacteria, but we see that for tropical ecosystems, the contribution of cyanobacteria, despite the fact that the total biovolume is not very high, the contribution is much higher. Uh, so in the, in the plot that is to the, to the right, 
It's just a zoom of the information from tropical lakes, and there we can see, as we expected, it's, 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 it's uh, obvious, that as more cyanobacteria we have, the contribution of cyanobacteria in the total community is higher. However, we, we can see that there are values of dominance where the total biovolume is not necessarily that high. So these tropical lakes are naturally um, dominated. Some of these tropical lakes are naturally dominated by cyanobacteria that are usually very tiny species. Now if we see, uh, again, just looking in general at the, about the data, the, the distribution of cyanobacteria with three major factors, temperature, total phosphorus, and total nitrogen. And here we have, the, again, the cyanobacteria biovolume. Uh, we can see that there is not a clear trend with temperature except for the extremes, like, like this one, no? like very low temperatures, and we see a positive trend with total phosphorus and total nitrogen. We perform a series of analyses with this uh, uh, database, including many different limnological variables. I will show you only one or two results. In this one, we have a conditional inference tree. It's an exploratory analysis where we use different, uh, uh, the list of, of basic or general limnological variables. And what we found here is that phosphorus was the, was the main factor, is the first node here was the main factor with a threshold of 73.4, which is quite consistent in changing to hypertrophic levels, uh, is splitting the, the, the database. And then we had some secondary variables, including uh, pH, which is quite something interesting if you want. We can talk it later about this more in detail. And uh, in this side is, uh, for this side is again in the low range, the low range of values, it's, uh, um, Phosphorus again, then the depth of the lakes, and this size is pH, and finally here appear total nitrogen. Uh, sorry, here I should have said that uh, we have the gradient of the uh, cyanobacteria biomass, no? an increasing gradient. So total phosphorus was the main variable explaining the trend, and in this analysis, temperature was not selected as a, as a significant variable. We perform many other analyses. Here I show you one of, of those where again, temperature was never selected. And here we have these uh, linear mix models for uh, total phosphorus, total nitrogen, and cyanobacteria. The variables are transformed and standardized. But I want you to pay attention in the, these lines, the trends that in, uh, indicate the very shallow lakes, the medium, the deep, deep lakes, and the deeper lakes, or the, yeah, more, yeah, deeper lakes. So here we can see that uh, in both here, uh, there is a positive trend, especially with the shallower lakes uh, with total phosphorus. And here we, ha we have a more clear, distinctive uh, behavior of shallow lakes with total nitrogen, with uh, um, their nitro nitrogen became very relevant for explaining the distribution of cyanobacteria in shallow lakes. Uh, the, this first uh, very general analysis uh, point out uh, very clear that unwanted cyanobacteria or cyanobacteria can develop high biomass in any kind of climate and independent of temperature if nutrients are enough. Of course, temperature is very important and temperature can make the things much worse. But the, f the first variables that are explaining or predicting this distribution are the nutrients. The other thing that we can see here is that lake depth is a critical factor to, pre to predict or to understand or to start analyzing more in detail the relationship with nutrients and cyanobacteria. And nutrient reduction and nutrient control of cyanobacteria and the, um, the historical debate between phosphorus and nitrogen and phosphorus and nitrogen, um, it's a Passion, uh, passionating and a very interesting discussion. And um, uh, you know, maybe you already know, or if you don't know, uh, maybe you can think about it now. We have a new SEAL group, working group. We had a, our very first meeting yesterday night with a very exciting and nice discussions about this topic. So if you are very interested, please check it out. That was my ad break for the day. <laughs> So, if we keep going here in the general part of the first, uh, the distribution and factors, we will have a, a quick look about the most frequent taxa. What are the most frequent taxa? And here I invite you to see first the, uh, the plot here to the left. 
uh, that involve all the Americas, all the, data, the complete database, and there we don't have any, any field. Oh, this, you cannot see the names very well there. Ah, yes, yes, here. There are here, oh, okay. Um, so we have, uh, we did the analysis at the, uh, the genius level, and we have here, uh, as we expected, a long list of cyanobacteria of different sizes, of different orders. Um, some of them are common and appear in blooms, but, but not necessarily. It's a, it's a quite a, a wide list and, and diversity of cyanobacteria that can be present. In the second plot here, uh, we select the data from South America, and we just uh, wanted to know where, where, uh, which were the most frequent taxa that can reach higher volume, bio volumes, higher biomass. And here we have a kind of other, a, a different picture. And what we can see in the list is that the one that appears in the number one is Raphidiopsis. And Raphidiopsis populations in this uh, database, there are almost all what it was before Cylindrospermopsis raciborski. Um, there are other species, but most of the information is that particular species that we will spend a minute to talk about it. Then other, other groups are Microcystis, Aphanocapsa, Plantotrix, Spherocarbon, etc. Dolicospermum is here, and so on. And Aphanismenon is quite low, quite uh, right down there. If we make a zoom in a, in a particular region to see this a little bit uh, more in detail, <clears throat> I choose this study to share with you about a study we did uh, for Uruguay, particularly with the same idea to see what is the distribution of cyanobacteria and which are the most common ones. And here, here we see that they are, as, 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 as I said to you before, they are almost everywhere. And the most common or the most frequent taxa were um, Dolicospermum and, and Microcystis, and they, they appear together in, some of, in many of these cases. And if you see uh, here, this is the frequ frequency and this is the biovolume of the most uh, representative genera here. Uh, we can see that they, uh, in terms of biomass, uh, there are other groups that can have a higher biomass than microcystis and dolicospermum. And here, this, is, uh, this has to be here, <laughs> it's the same one. Uh, Cylindrospermopsis is having um, quite a large biomass. So, I want to spend just a little bit in, in detail about this species. This is a fascinating species. We've studied, we've studied this species quite a bit in our lab. Uh, it's a species that has a global distribution and has, it has been um, studied a lot, has been studied a lot because it was considered at one point an invasive species or an expansion or an alien species. And actually, uh, all our, our work, more from the physiology um, part, uh, are, uh, uh, how can I say this, are um, showing or demonstrating that this is a very unique uh, plastic species. It has a high physiological plasticity. Uh, it has ecotypes with different preferences for the environment. And we have the hypothesis that we would like to demonstrate soon that instead of being, uh, that we can consider this species as a sentinel species of eutrophication. Uh, Cylindrospermopsis, ex Cylindrospermopsis rasiborg is a species that in general appear in mesotrophic environments quite quickly, quite soon, uh, producing high biomass with not very high concentration of fo total phosphorus. Um, so if we see in this map, uh, sorry, if we see in, the, in this map to the to the right, this is a study we are we are we are uh, carrying out now. Uh, in blue, in blue are the the points of a review that was made uh, about the distribution of this this species um, in 1997 by Judith Padisac. Uh, in in red are information that comes only from genetical analysis, and in in green are all the information that we are having for our uh, work that we are do doing now. <clears throat> there is another aspect that is very relevant about this species and make it so interesting, and it's the production of toxins. And again, um, uh, there are many studies that are quite amazing about the uh, phylogenetic story of the toxins and the evolution of this species and where they appear in the world. In the Americas, the toxin that this species produces are 
so neurotoxins or succitoxins and analogs, while in other regions of the world, like in Australia, they produce cylindrospermopsin, other toxins, completely different. And I would like you to pay attention to this uh, map here, where we have the information that we, we uh, compile from reports from field uh, data and from cultures isolated uh, in different parts of South America. And all the red spots and the orange, red, brownish spots are related with the production of saxitoxin and analogs. And if we look and if we pay more attention about the few information we have from North America, none of the uh, strains or populations have toxins, except for, for one in, in Florida down there. Uh, in this, in this uh, figure that we have here at the left, is just to show that uh, despite the fact of the production, pro, sorry, the production of these toxins, uh, the toxicity can change uh, very, very, very much uh, between different strains in populations. In this study, we compare two strains, one from Brazil and one from Uruguay, that had different analogs of these neurotoxins, uh, resulting in different uh, levels of potential toxicity for predators or for uh, human health. So this is a species quite interesting, and um, I'm sure there are much more things to discover in South America about the distribution of cylindrospermopsis, ex cylindrospermopsis or Rasiborski, especially in, in many areas where we don't have any information. And, and the idea of uh, having the species as a sentinel of changes, it's something that I would like more people to, you know, to be interested in first in the opinion if you if you agree, <laughs> and then second if you think it will be interesting to study this. So going now to the second part. In the second part, we will see very uh, briefly <laughs> uh, the pigment diversity and what are the implications for monitoring. Now we are in start to talk, starting to talk more about monitoring. I love these pictures because this is like a natural extracts of phycocyanin, what we have here. No? Just the nature made the extract itself. Uh, we have, I don't know if you see the color bright, bright, very bright. Uh, and the screens here is brighter than, than in the big picture here, it's a pity. But this is bright, bright, bright blue. And here also we have some kind of bright blue of senescent blooms that you know, the cells breaks and the phycocyanin kind just came out. Pigments are fundamental traits uh, for all photosynthetic organisms, and this, but they have been not very well studied, I think, that's my modest opinion, um, especially in cyanobacteria, which they are so diverse there, and they are very special traits, but at the same time, it's very difficult or com not difficult, um, complex, because the information we get from pigments, um, it's a double or triple. We, have, we get information from um, what are the groups the organisms are belonging. And so pigments are very, very uh, strongly linked with evolution in the big groups of, of photosynthetic pigments, of course. We have very different pigments according to the evolutionary big groups. But at the same time, the pigments change according to the physiological states of the organisms and change with acclimation and change with light, the light environment, of course. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Here in this picture, I am showing you like a fingerprint. I, I, I like to think that these uh, plots are like fingerprints. What we have here is the absorption, the in vivo absorption spectra of different cyanobacteria cultures here are the different strains, and they were ordered it according to their order, their phylo phylogenetical order. And these fingerprints are telling us like different pictures of these different groups. This means that we have different pigments assemblages that can be chromofunctional groups. This is a good question that we are exploring now, and Cremela presented yesterday. Uh, so. Hopefully we will have the answer soon. <laughs> uh, anyway, we, have, we see here that there are different proportions, and I want you to pay attention in this peak. For example, this group where we can find many picocyanobacteria, they have a high proportion of ficocyanin. 
And why is this so important? Because uh, pigments are becoming more and more uh, important for monitoring cyanobacteria because they are biomarkers of cyanobacteria. So how we monitor in cyanobacteria? Basically, we have biomarkers. Biovolume is the best indicator of biomass, of course. And then we have, in, uh, then we have historically associated chlorophyll A2, concentration of chlorophyll A. Now uh, we have so many um, probes and um, continuous measurement sensors that measure fluorescence of chlorophyll A in Z2, for example. And, of course, phycocyanin is coming more and more added to these sensors to measure the fluorescence of phycocyanin. And, of course, chlorophyll A is, uh, is the base of remote sensing retrieval uh, signal for the reflectance of these pigments in the water. So pigments are very important in monitoring cyanobacteria. Uh, so what we wanted to see was, first, what is the relationship between the biovolume? That is what we want to know. I mean, the pigments are, are proxies. The pigments are proxies that has, have to give us an idea of how, how much, how many cyanobacteria we have in the water, because that can give us an idea of, for example, health consequences or ecological consequences, of course, for the environment. And in that case, biovolume is the best indicator to, to decide what to do after that. So we wanted to explore first what was the relationship between this biovolume and chlorophyll A with field samples. Here I pick up, this is, of course, this is not my study, of course, this is, I am quoting uh, Corus and Welker. These are uh, part of the guides, of the new guides of the uh, World Health Organization where they have, they have different levels. I just pick up uh, three because we work in an exercise with these three. Uh, levels for alert levels for drinking water. Another one for drinking the water is the number two, which is the one for recreational waters and recreational waters too. And we have different levels of biovolume and chlorophyll A. So for each level of biovolume, we expect to have a range of chlorophyll A. And we wanted to know if we use our field data, and if we have only chlorophyll A, what biovolume we can infer from the chlorophyll A. So we took our, that, our big database and we add new data. This is an ongoing uh, study now. And what we have here is, these are the levels defined by chlorophyll A, three of the levels I showed you before by chlorophyll A. And for each of these three levels of defined by chlorophyll A, <clears throat> we plot here the distribution of the biovolume that we found in the samples. And what we have in gray here of the three, is the three levels is the theoretical biovolume that we are expecting for each of the levels. So this is the first drinking water level, the second one, drinking water two, or, uh, recreational water one, and this is the recreational water two. So for these three levels, we are expecting these gray boxes of uh, biovolume. Uh, there is something very important I didn't say at the beginning, and please, the, the data, we filter the data with dominance of cyanobacteria in the samples, which is uh, quite important, and it's one of the things that in the guides, it's specifically indicated that you need dominance of cyanobacteria. So what we can see here is the distribution of the real data, and we can see that in the different levels, uh, the probability of being in the right level of biomass in some cases is quite good, for example, in this one, but in the other cases, it's quite variable. If we, here we have the dominance of cyanobacteria in this first level, but if we analyze the same thing but with all data, the probability drop down to 24%. So that means that if I only have chlorophyll A and I don't have any idea what's going on with the community, I won't have a clear, or I can have a quite uh, different results for the biomass I can, I can uh, infer in that sample. 
What is the other aspect that we have to consider about payments and monitoring? And this is another aspect that is even uh, maybe a little bit more difficult to extract from the field samples, and maybe why the field samples show that variation. And it's that pigment content changed with light, changed quite a lot. So in this, in this study, what we see here is, this is a study, uh, again, it's a, it's a current study that we are performing now, uh, with different strains. We have eight different strains, and we acclimate them first, then we run um, experiments, grow experiments, and we analyze the content of chlorophyll A per cell, the content of chlorophyll A per biovolume, and phycocyanin per biovolume in three different light intensities. What we can see is that the content of the pigment can change two to four times or more according to the light conditions, the light environment. Of course, the change, if you use just cells, the, the, the variation of the data is much more because the cells can be big or small, and they will have more or less biomass and more or less pigment because of the size of the cell. So this is a quite more, more uh, uh, messy, no, a more variable result. I don't know what the, what's the right word. And now if we, we look at in detail what's going on with phycocyanin, for example, here we have different strains. The ones in red are nostocalis. Here we have one oscillatorial, and here we have two crococalis, two microcystis strains. And what I am plotting here, oh, sorry, what I am plotting here is the difference in the content of phycocyanin when the culture is growing in dim light. So how much more phycocyanin they have in the bio volume when they are growing in dim light in comparison with when we were growing with high light. So here we see that they, they have much more phycocyanin, but the other thing we can see is that they can have a, a wide difference in change in phycocyanin between groups. So, so um, according with the results of other colleagues, um, the, there are differences that can be consistent between orders, again, and the, less, the least variables are the crococalis, like microcystis, but the nostocalis had a huge variation in the content of perfile, uh, sorry, phycocyanin dependent on the light conditions. So again, if I am using phycocyanin to track cyanobacteria, this is something that we have to take into account. I think that was the next, yes, <laughs> that was the next, the next uh, picture, no? for fluorescence probes or monitoring in situ uh, populations. So pigments are quite relevant to take it into account, and there are a lot of uh, interesting things to study about pigments and use them for monitoring cyanobacteria and find out more how to use them. We are arriving to the last part. Um, so in this part I'm going to talk more about directly blooms and monitoring and monitoring frameworks for South America and challenges. And I'd just like you to pay attention on this picture. This picture is a tractor um, taking out cyanobacteria from the sand on a beach in Montevideo. The tractor reminds me the, the the snow plow in Quebec City <laughs> when they <laughs> when they pass in winter, something like that. But instead of snow, they are taking out biomass or cyanobacteria. So blooms can be as bad as this as this situation, and this is a huge problem, of course, with many consequences that needs deserves uh, many research, deserves studies and more and more research of course so how bad they can be these blooms you can have waters like this you see this fluorescent green fluorescent like my dress i'm sure you won't swim there today uh, for this part of this, the, the analysis of the study, we dig deep into every single report, publication, and everything that was out there about blooms in South America and the Caribbean. Everything. Uh, yeah? Okay. So this is what we, uh, something of what we found, of course, and here we have the information classified by country, these are the number of reports by country, these are the taxa, again, summarized at the level of the, of the genius level. 
And here we have the percentage of these um, taxa reported in Bloom cases. To, to be honest, I think the, the, just the concept of Bloom is quite elusive. In all these publications, Blooms were defined by different criteria, and I think scientific community still doesn't know what a cyanobacteria bloom is. Maybe, maybe we are clear in what is a bloom, but not what is a cyanobacteria bloom. Uh, they were ma there are many classifications, visual classifications, the color of the water, quantitative classifications, but they are also different. They had many different thresholds. And so I think it's a quite an interesting discussion to have. So what we, he what we see here, and with, uh, I want you to pay maybe more attention, is the large variation between countries. So we have countries like, for example, Argentina, where we, ha where we found 220 studies about specifically blooms in the field, blooms in different, in, in different um, ecosystems, while in some other countries, like Nicaragua, Honduras, they have only, we, we find only one. So uh, the information is still um, not clear. This information is not clear. Is this is the case of that they don't have problems with cyanobacteria or there is a lack of studies about fresh waters and cyanobacteria? Concerning the, the toxins that we found reported for cyanobacteria, the, the, most of the cases were referred to analysis about microcystins. Of course, not all the time with blooms were detected, there were analysis of toxins associated, not, not always. And in second place, there were reports about saxitoxins and cylindrospermopsin. Oh, yeah. um, in here, we, have, we build up this map. To build up this map, we um, investigate and put together on the table all the regulations for monitoring cyanobacteria in the continent. So, we can start looking at this little uh, box here, where I, uh, we have here this uh, circle, circle in, in three pieces. And so, this first triangle here, the first piece, refers to monitoring recreational waters. The other one is monitoring water supplies. And the third one is related to the presence of regulations for uh, um, regulations related with thresholds of cyanobacteria or toxins in the water, the drinking water or recreational water. So if the areas are all shaded in, in, in gray, means that the country has this kind of monitorings and regulations. If they have something but not completely, the, uh, not completely regulations on monitoring or is quite despair, we have this you know, partially applied condition, and if it is completely white, it's because there is nothing there. The first thing we can see here, it's an uneven reality. It's unbelievable, but it's true. This is our reality. It's so different between countries. And you can see even between regions, regions within the same continent. We have countries where they don't have anything at all. They don't know what's going on, and they don't have any monitoring or regulation at all. But, but, even in the, in the countries where we have all the areas shaded in gray, which are Brazil and Uruguay, that's the only one, the only two, the uh, monitoring systems and the regulations are also different. For example, in Brazil, uh, the regulations imply the quantification and report of cyanobacteria in cells per milliliter or per liter, per volume, while in Uruguay we are using biovolume per milliliter or volume. And these two differences are, they have a huge impact in monitoring, but also in an, an, analyzing this data with an ecological perspective too. They are completely it's, it's quite controversial, this, and I mean, how we can compare data, data generated like that. If we look at Peru, for example, they have, in their regulations, they have um, indicated that reports have to be done in individuals per liter of cyanobacteria, while in some areas of Peru, they are already counting biovolume. 
So the situation is quite uh, very, very um, uneven. <laughs> Let's go to the last, I am arriving to the last part of this talk. Um, and we, I, I want to show some, some or talk or, or, or just think about it maybe and, and then we can discuss it together about challenges and opportunity with, opportunities with all this scenario. But I couldn't avoid to put this last picture here to show you. These are the most giant colonies I ever seen in my whole life. And I have a long life. They, yeah, <laughs> I won't say how long. That's <laughs> a long. So these are colonies of Microcystis besenberry. They are terrifying big. So the blooms can be ter yeah, terrible, terrible. Here we have uh, about just, just uh, one second uh, thinking about challenges and what are the current threats of, for freshwater ecosystems in South America. And in the review we made, we collected that the most important one is eutrophication related with, usually with agriculture or, or other, uh, other human impacts that remove the soil or whatever. So the management of harmful cyanobacteria has to be focused in minimizing eutrophication. This can sound obvious, I know. Maybe you're looking at me and, and saying, this woman is telling us obvious things, but it's not that obvious at all. Um, so, efficient measures to reduce the amount of nutrients that are arriving to the waters, it's a mandate for the whole continent. Very clear one. But what happens when, when we think this situation and the future, what are the future threats for freshwater ecosystems in South America? Maybe the ones more related with cyanobacteria, but, uh, or for, with everything. Well, the first one, contamination. The prediction says that for some regions of South America, especially the south of Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, Chile also, uh, we are predicting to have an intensification in agriculture. We have new contamination problems like the lithium triangle in Bolivia, Chile and Argentina too, coming. On top of contamination, we have predicted building more dams so in, in increased river fragmentation. While in some other regions of the world, they are thinking to take out the dams and finish with that, we are planning to build up more. And we have many rivers in this continent, so we can go. Especially in, in, in Brazil, uh, and in Uruguay, we have a, we have a terrible law that uh, promote, not promote, but make it very easy to make dams uh, and reservoirs everywhere. And on top, of, on top of that, of course, is climate change. So climate change for the region, uh, you know, we have problems and increase of extreme events, glacier melting, and of course, making worse all the situations uh, that we mentioned before. So with, if, we, if we think about what we have in front of us concerning cyanobacteria blooms and monitoring and mitigation, uh, in general, we saw that we have limited, well, we didn't see that, but I can tell you, we have limited budgets. <laughs> uh, there are gaps in knowledge, uh, large areas where we don't have many information or we don't have much information. Regulations are very uneven between countries and open data are still, the access of open data are, are still very limited. So let's talk about some, uh, what I would like I put opportunities, maybe. Maybe I could have chosen a, another word. So I would like to share with you an initiative where we are involved now to work with a municipality in Uruguay. And I think it's a good example of some, something that it can be done and get great results. The municipality in Uruguay is uh, dealing or is, is carrying on a um, visual monitoring program for recreational waters in Montevideo along uh, a long coast in Montevideo, and they monitor in uh, 15 different beaches in the summer, weekly, and they use a visual classification of the presence, absence, presence, or scums in the water, and when the scums are present in the number two, the category which is in red, the, uh, um, uh, the, 
they put a, a flag alert. This is the, the flag that is uh, here red with a green cross. And in that monitoring program, the lifeguards and the local um, authorities and technicians are participating. Uh, participating sorry. Uh, we, we start a new cooperation with them, and we are going to analyze and contribute to improve this system, which is quite successful. So just to show you one, one preliminary analysis, here we have the three levels, zero, one, and two, going in this direction. And here we have the concentration of total microsystems. Uh, in, in dotted lines, I just added uh, one of the, of the levels of the guides of the WHO for, for uh, LR microsystem. So we can see in this simple analysis that the visual category is a, it's a way to get powerful information, maybe information that we can even model to see trends in long term about cyanobacteria in that area. So that is a, a quite a nice, I think, initiative. Another option and another alternative that I think is very important and we should have to uh, implement it in South America is integrating multi-level tools for monitoring cyanobacteria. You cannot monitor in cyanobacteria with one thing or two. You have to integrate several ones. So here we have, for example, in this recent study, we are um, proposing, suggesting a new strategy combining uh, continuous monitoring in situ with satellite images to monitor, to improve the monitoring of large ecosystems like the estuary of Rio de la Plata. And in this other study, for example, we calibrate hand, uh, very small fluorometers, handhold fluorometers that you can use, for example, complementing the visual monitoring uh, programs. So from from a cubet in the lab to the satellites images, we are trying to put together uh, ideas, integrating multi-level tools to improve monitoring cyanobacteria. Of course, uh, we need more training, we need more networking, sharing, discussing, and open data. Uh, networking and discussing and sharing with initiatives like, for example, LACAN, or this new seal, uh, seal uh, work group, or other, other initiatives like Leon, for example, they are essential in this case. And open data also. So for open data, I am just finishing, and I will show you uh, one example that I am, I am, I think it's a, it's a good one, and it's from the Ministry of Environment of Uruguay. They have a platform with an open da data database quite large. And so they are monitoring the whole country. They have information for, for, different, for different purposes, and there is one about water quality. So you have here all these dots that they are related with the main rivers in the main watersheds, most of them. And it, this is information that they are collecting themselves uh, with monitoring programs, but also they are collaborating with scientists. So many scientists have cooperation agreements with the ministry and they are uh, giving them information, scientific information, and they are uploading the information there. So if you click in one of these dots, you can get information of total phosphorus, total nitrogen, dissolved nutrients, chlorophyll A, and many other variables that are there. So I think this is a, a very, and they are just open. If you go there, after I finish, you can run to your computer and just start downloading the data. It's in Spanish, it's the only thing. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's a, it's a great initiative, and I think it's a, it's a great idea that I would like to see more around the continent. So just finishing here and summarizing. Uh, along this talk, I was going quite fast about different aspects of cyanobacteria. Some of them more apply, more related with monitoring, some, some of them more basic. Um, and uh, in the three sections, so just, just uh, summarizing the last idea that I would like to, to give you or to, or to uh, think about it, maybe that's, that's a word. It's, uh, we need more research on cyanobacteria and for freshwater in general. There are large inequalities, inequalities between countries that makes the studies of cyanobacteria quite difficult sometimes. And 
I would like to see general strategies and common frameworks to go and improve monitoring and solve problems. Thank you very much.